Hello and welcome to Morning Coffee with Jesus. I'm Rebecca and today we're going to be talking about distractions. What is currently distracting you in your everyday life? We're going to find out today how those distractions play a major part in your life. So stay tuned. So we're talking about distractions. Let me know in the comments what currently distracts you. We have so many different things in our lives that shift our focus. And I think of a dog when they're running or playing fetch, and all of a sudden they see a squirrel, they stop, and now their focus is completely somewhere else. Well, we do this in our everyday life. We have so many different things that we see when we're driving, when we're walking, when we're talking. So many things that go through our brain that we constantly think about, and it can shift our focus just like that. So I want us to talk about distractions and how they play into our everyday life and how it can affect us in different ways. So the one thing I know that I've seen, even in my own personal life, is cell phones. Think about it. We have them with us everywhere, and it's really easy for us to click on something and start scrolling. Well, you don't even realize that hours have gone by because we've just been sitting there looking at different things, and because there's so much on a particular app and things like that, that our focus is constantly going from this to that, that we don't even realize how much time we have sat there and looked at this until we need to go start doing something else or someone comes and is like, hey, where have you been? And we take all of our time and we put it on distractions. And like I said, I'm going to be the first one to raise my hand and say that I've been guilty of doing this to where I'll open my phone and I'm checking notifications and emails and things like that. And then I'll look up at the clock and I'm like, oh my gosh, my whole day has been gone because I've been doing this. And this is not anything that I needed to be doing to be productive today. So distractions on one hand can help people if you're in pain and things like that. People want a distraction to take their mind off of things, to not feel sad or angry. And so a distraction in those senses can be good because we're not sitting there thinking about someone, you know, who's passed away and getting into a state of depression. But if we use a distraction as our way of finding relief, it's always going to bring us back to a low place. Why is that? Because a distraction is temporary. What distracts you in one moment may not distract you tomorrow. So we have to find a firm foundation that has our attention that's not just keeping us from thinking or doing something else, but it is actually propelling us to help us in our future, to help us grow, not just physically and mentally, but also spiritually. So I want you guys to go with me to Proverbs 19, 18. I'm going to read this out of the New King James Version first. It says, Chastise your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. Now, the part that I want to play out here is where it says, Do not set your heart on his destruction. What are we setting our heart on? Why is our heart important? We've talked about this in past, but our heart is vital in this world. Think about it. If your heart stops beating right now, what happens to you? That's the end of your time here on this earth. Thankfully, we have a spirit, so we are eternal beings, but that heart here on the earth has that ability for us to continue doing things here. And I know sometimes people are like, well, maybe it's a good thing if I'm not here anymore. That will, you know, take a burden off of someone or, you know, I won't be a mess up or hurt anyone anymore. And I want you guys to know that God loves you and he sees you as valuable. In fact, he wouldn't have 
aided you if he thought that you were a failure, if he thought that you weren't good enough. Did you know that God didn't create any thing that has a defect. He created you unique. He created you perfect. You are loved and valued by God. So when we look at it from that perspective and we think of we're setting our heart on and then we need to think what are we setting it on? When we think about our heart, we use this term a lot of times when we're talking about, you know, love, right? I love you with all my heart. Or, you know, they have a big heart. We use it in a certain way that has a lot of meaning and value. And so here when the Word of God is telling us, do not set your heart on His destruction. Now I want to read this in another translation for you guys because it brought a whole different light to it. We're going to read this out of the NIV now. It says, discipline your children for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. Think about that for a second. That slight change of wording opens up a whole new way of thinking. Discipline your children. A lot of times we think, well, I don't want to discipline them. You know, they need to learn from their mistakes. And we're not here to argue about any of this. But the Word of God is telling us to discipline our children. Discipline meaning be willing to teach them and train them. Hey, this is what the word of God says. This is what he says is right. And this is what he says is wrong. Not just saying you don't, you don't know what you're doing. You're not good at this. You need to stop doing that. We've got to take it to another level to where we are teaching. Discipline comes with a way of redirecting, refocusing, and letting that child know how to overcome whatever it was that they did in that moment. If we are just constantly saying, don't do that anymore, but then we don't know why we're not doing anymore and we don't understand, well, how can I not do those things anymore? Because we live in a flesh and our flesh wants a lot of things that it shouldn't have. I mean, we can look at all the foods that are so bad for us that taste so good, right? And our flesh wants to eat those things. So how do we become discipline. Well, we become disciplined when we understand the negative effects of those things on our life and how we can counterbalance, how we can eat what is good versus what is bad. So there's a learning process in being disciplined. It's not God just saying, oh, you're no good. The end you know, one strike, two strikes, oh, you're done, right? No, he is there to teach and train us and he's gonna show us not just the areas that we lack or are missing, but he's gonna show us the areas that we are good at, that we excel in. So we can use our strengths and help those weak areas as well. Think about it. Your natural physical body, we have muscles. And at first it takes us time to grow those muscles, right? But if we do it the correct way, we're going to grow quicker and faster and not hurt ourselves. If you've ever worked out before and you did not know what you were doing, you don't have to raise your hand, but you know firsthand that there are some things that you could have avoided because you did it properly instead of strained those muscles, pulled that thing that you shouldn't have, all because you took time to learn and grow. So here when he's telling us to discipline your children, for there's hope in that. We should get excited about these things because this doesn't just mean parents teaching their children. This is for us. Why is it for us? Because we are God's children. So he is disciplining us in a loving teaching manner to what? Give us hope. Then it goes to say, don't be a willing party to their death. God doesn't want to partake in leading us down a path of destruction, down a path that leads to death. He's always trying to lead us to the path of life, which is what we're supposed to be doing as well. Leading by example. Well, how do we lead by example? 
we have to first follow the main example, which is our Heavenly Father. And as we follow Him, now we can take a lead role and begin to teach and disciple others around us. One of the things that this verse really brought out to me was how we see ourselves and how we see others. A lot of times we can use this as a distraction as well to where when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we see ourselves one way versus someone else looks at us and they see us completely different. And we tend to go to the negative side of things of if someone, um, you know, starts doing drugs or they're on alcohol or they're always getting in trouble and all the things, right? We tend to look at that and we open this mouth and we speak out what we see and we say, oh, they're an addict. Oh, they're a troublemaker. Oh, they're a liar, right? We base it off of current events or experiences that we've seen from that person. And we've got to shift our perspective. That is a distraction. We're looking at a natural thing of this is how they are right now. This is them currently. And we label them as that is their future self as well. If we always look at someone for them now and say that's who they'll always be, that's how we will always talk about them. That's how we'll always see them. We have to begin to see them better. If someone is sick, we need to see them whole. If someone has been, you know, broken down, we need to see them as restored. If someone is in a state of depression, we need to see them as freed. If someone is in a dark place, we need to see them in the light of the Lord. If someone is, you guys fill in the blank, but see them for the better. Because when we start seeing them in a better light, we're going to start talking about them in a better way. So no matter if your mind thinks, well, they've lied to me a hundred times, they've stolen from me, they've done this, they've done that. No matter how we saw them in the past, no matter how you see them in the present, How do we see them in the future? Think, no, that person can get delivered. That person can change. Before you accepted Jesus into your heart, there were things in our life that we didn't have right. And the Lord didn't look at our present time and say, no, you're not good enough. I can't forgive you. No, I don't love you. You're not this yet. No, God looked at us where we were right then and right there. And he said, I love you. I forgive you. I'm here for you. That's how God sees us every day to where he constantly wants to give us better. He wants to take away all those distractions that the world tries to put on your life and let you see from his perspective. Let you see not just yourself, but see your family, to see your coworkers, to see random people that you come in contact with in the store differently. Because we're not basing off of what we see in that five minute, eight hours time period. God goes beyond what man sees. And he looks inwardly on the heart. He knows that people don't want to live in a state of depression, in a state of addiction, in a state of pain. He's always trying to bring us out, but the enemy's always trying to put a distraction in our way. John 10.10 tells us this, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, which is Jesus, have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The enemy's always going to try and put distractions in our way, always going to try and cause separation, try and lead us down the wrong path, the path that leads to death. But God is always trying to pull us back to him and say, come to me here. Look, these are the things. These are the answers that you need. But so many times what happens, we can pull this little phone out, start scrolling and get so 
distracted that we feel like we failed. We feel like, well, can't do that now, or I've tried that 10 million times and I failed every single time, or I start good and then it ends bad. Distractions. That's what we're talking about here this morning. And the Lord showed me that distractions create destruction. I want you guys to think about that for a second. Distractions create destruction. That means when we shift our focus the wrong way, it leads us down a dark path to where we don't even realize it's happening. And then all of a sudden, everything starts falling apart in our life. And we question and wonder why, how did it get this bad? How are all these things the way they are? It all started with a distraction. The enemy is so good at placing those small things in there that take away so much of your life and so much of your time that it consumes you. It absorbs everything that you have to where you get tired, you get drained, you get frustrated. Can I get an amen? I know that this is something that happens to so many of us. And we don't have to allow a distraction to cause destruction in our life because we become aware of the distractions around us. And like I said, at first you may not realize it's a distraction, but the moment you do, that's when we need to say, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not gonna do it anymore. So my phone, okay, like I said, this is a huge one in our society right now, this phone that we have. So set maybe a time limit on your phone to where you can't get on certain apps or you can't uh, be on certain social medias or watch videos for longer than a period of time. It's okay to set that up to where we are eliminating those distractions in our life. Now, I want you guys to see a couple different things here with me. In Colossians 3, 2, I'm going to read this out of the message translation. We're going to start in verse 1, actually. It says, So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along. Eyes to the ground, absorbed with things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. This translation is so good because it's reminding us, don't keep your eyes looking down, looking at the ground, constantly looking where your feet are going. We recently went roller skating and it's really easy for you to constantly look down and make sure you're not going to trip, that you know what you're doing, you're not going to fall and embarrass yourself. But that can be a distraction as well to where we're constantly looking at our feet and where we're going. And the Lord is reminding us here to look up, to be alert on things of Him because that's where all the good action is. If you're constantly looking down, you're gonna miss what's going on. And God wants good things for you. So he's constantly trying to pick your head up and say, stop looking down. Who are you trusting? Are you looking down at what you can see? Or are you looking up at me for all the possibilities? He wants to open our eyes to see bigger, better, things. If we read this in the Passion Translation, it says, yes, feast on all the treasures of heaven, of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. It's telling us that when we shift that focus, we're going to see the treasures of the heavenly realm and things that were impossible now look possible and become a reality to us because we are looking at where we're headed and then we're able to move in that direction. But if we're looking at right here, right now, sometimes you're going to see a broken bridge and think, I can't get from this side to that side. I don't have the finances. I don't have the intellect. I don't have the education. I don't know the right people. 
And that will cause you to stay on this side in this natural realm with all of the limitations that the world will try and put on you. But when we look to the other side and say, that is what I want. That's what God wants for me. Then we now begin to see the plan. It's almost as if a bridge is literally being built right in front of us to where we're able to cross over to the other side because we're looking to God. We're looking at where He says that we can go. And if God says you can make it to the other side, He has a way to get you there. He's not going to say, oh, you figure it out, and then we have to try a hundred different mistakes before we finally figure out the right formula. No, God has the perfect formula. He knows exactly what you need to do and how you need to do it. It's simply saying, Lord, give me wisdom. Help me out here. The word tells us if we lack wisdom, we just have to ask. So simply saying, Lord, give me that wisdom that I need to get me to the other side. And God will begin to give you that plan. He'll begin to build that bridge for you. And then you just have to step out in faith and cross over and see those heavenly things become your reality. But like I said, it's really easy for us to get into a state of what we can see right now and base it off of what we can have tomorrow. Well, I want you guys to look at 2 Corinthians 4. We're going to read verse 16 to 18 out of the message translation. It says, so we're not giving up. So I want you to stop right there and say that. I'm not giving up. You may feel like giving up right at this moment, but I want you to say it out loud. I'm not giving up. God hasn't given up on me. I'm not giving up. God still believes in me. I'm not giving up. God cares for me. I'm not giving up. You may need to say this a hundred times a day, but anytime you get that feeling of, I can't, it won't happen, it's not possible, stop and say, I'm not giving up because God hasn't given up on me. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on us. On the inside, where God is making new life. Not a day goes by without His unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here that meets the eye. The things we see now are here today, gone tomorrow. But the things we can't see now will last forever. I also want to read this in the NIV translation, which says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Fixing our eyes on things that are not seen. He's telling us here, shift your focus. Stop looking at what you can see in this natural realm because those things are temporary. They're here one day and gone the next. But things which we can't see, they're forever. And I know our natural mind tries to wrap around this and it's like, that doesn't make any sense. But I want you to think of it this way. You have a wall. Look at the wall in front of you, wherever you're at. That wall, you see it as a structure, as something that you can see, touch. It's a barrier that keeps you from getting to the other side. But if we actually broke it down and looked at it, it's little tiny things that we cannot see that make up that wall. But because our natural eyes see it as a whole, we can't sometimes get our mind to wrap around the internal side of things. Just like our physical body, we see it as a whole. And when things are going on on the inside of our body that hurt or are not sitting right, we tend to go to a doctor to get what? Looked at, analyzed, diagnosed, to figure out what's happening on 
the inside. Well, just like if you in the natural go to a doctor to get a diagnosis, we with our spirit need to go to the heavenly father doctor, our physician and say, I need an examination. Check me on the inside. And then he looks at you and he gives you the best prescription, the best diagnosis, the thing that will completely change everything in your life. But just like in the natural, if a doctor gives you a prescription and says, you need to take this three times a day, you need to take it with food, take it with water, however they tell you to take it, if you don't do it, you don't see the benefits of it. Well, God is giving you that prescription that you need in every area that you can think of. And he's saying, this is all that needs to be done in order for things to get better. And when we do it, we reap the benefits of it. But just like here on this earth, we have the choice to say, oh, I'm not going to take that anymore. I'm good. Or uh, they said, take it three times. I'm going to take it one time. Again, do you want to reap the benefits? Well, God's word gives us all the instruction that we ever have need of. It tells us how to be parents, how to be spouses, how to be ch good children, how to be um, everything. And when we follow the instructions, we will reap the benefits. And sometimes it sounds simple to where we're like, well, that sounds too good to be true. God has laid this out. He's not trying to make it difficult. He's not trying to say, well, if you can pass this and this and this and this, then you're qualified. He's like, no, I've put it in my word. I've made this very simple for you. It's just a matter of you listening and following through with what his word says. Like the verse we just read talking about not seeing with our eyes out here, looking at all the natural things, but looking beyond and looking to God is actually having faith. Think about that. Faith. Well, why is faith important? Well, we're about to read that in Hebrews 11, 1. We're going to read this in the Passion Translation. It says, Now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. Faith proves what? is still unseen. Think about that. Faith is that activator that we need to bring things into our lives that we can't currently see. I love that. Faith brings our hopes into reality. That should be our foundation. If you don't have a firm foundation, things aren't going to last very long for you. Things are going to fall apart. We're getting back into that. Distraction creates destruction. We have to have a firm foundation in order to have faith to bring those hopes into a reality. The New King James Version tells us, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is a substance. Think about that. We have to have faith in order to obtain anything that you need in this natural realm. Despite the possibilities, we unlock impossibilities and they become possibilities with faith. If we jump down to verse 6 here, it tells us, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Not getting distracted, but seeking him diligently. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We have to have faith. Faith is our heavenly currency. Just like here on the earth, we have a currency that allows us to say, I'll give you this for that. And we're able to make that exchange. Well, 
Faith is our heavenly currency to where when we need healing, we have faith and there's that exchange, that transfer that takes place. Why do we need faith? We have to have faith for one, because faith unlocks those unseen things, right? And brings them into the scene. So it is a shifting that takes place. Faith is a yielding. It is a way of saying, I believe your word, Lord. I believe what you say is true. And I expect it to happen in my life. It's that exchange of faith released and the Lord says, all right, there you go. God cannot work on your behalf unless you give him right. And I know we all would love to think that, well, you know, if God wanted me to have it, he would give it to me. But we have a part to play in that, you guys. He cannot do anything for you unless you allow him to. If you don't want healing, you don't have to get healed. If you don't want to be wealthy, you don't have to be wealthy. If you don't want all these things that are good working in your life, you don't have to have any of them. But God has a better way for you to live. And he wants you to have those things. So I want you to grasp a hold of that. If this is the only thing you get, I want you to understand that God wants you to have good in your life. All you have to do is have faith and believe you receive that God wants to give that to you. The moment you believe that, you unlock faith and say, I believe God wants me to have that and I receive it. Take the exchange. Just like if you go into a natural store, if you hand someone money to buy something and they're put it in a bag for you and they're the bags right here and they're like here you go if you don't grab that bag and take it with you you just gave them money for what nothing there was an exchange that was trying to be made but you have to take what it is that you purchased. Well, God has already purchased everything for us. The only thing we have to do is have faith to believe we receive in order to take that gift, to take healing, to take success, to take freedom. God wants to help us grow. He wants to help take away those distractions. And when our focus is on Him, it's not going to be easily distracted by everything that the enemy is trying to put in your way, everything that pops up. So when you get that little ding or that notification on your phone, it's not like a, I want to see what that was or what am I missing out on? Because you're not missing out on anything because you have the creator of the universe attention. And anything that you have need of, anything that you want, that you desire, he wants you to have it. So you know exactly what it is that you would like in your life. What changes you want made, what things you want for your future. And if you don't, that's something that you would want as well to have that clarity of what does God want for my future? What does he want me to do in my life? Well, this morning, I want you to let me know in the comments how we can pray for you this week. How can we stand in agreement with you? Is it you need to know what your calling is in life? Is it you need healing? Is it you need finances? Is it you need restoration? Is it you need a change in your mindset? We are here to pray for you. We love you. God loves you. We are the body of Christ and we want to come together to be able to strengthen one another, encourage each other, lift you up to where you can see great things in your life, to where you don't let distraction become 
a destruction in your life. If that's you, if you don't want everyone to know things about you, that's fine. You can just type me in the comments and we will reach out to you privately. You can also email me at morningcoffeewithjesus at hotmail.com. You can mail in your letters to P.O. Box 244 Trenton, Texas, 75490. But we want you to know that we love you. We pray for you daily, whether we've met you in person, whether we've talked to you online. We love you. We pray for you. We value your life because you were created for a purpose and a reason. And we know that God has great things in store for you. We want you to know that we love you. God loves you. You're never too young or too old to fulfill the call. We'll see you next week. Bye, you guys.